Hello to the chicos and the chicas. This is inside my head. Um, the usual story when I'm playing down a lot just to demonstrate ideas and all kinds of concepts that hopefully I can demonstrate well. And of course, we would not mind at all to get uh, a little bit of insight into the thinking of an 1100 player. So let's see how we go here. Um, I could not figure out for the life of me how to add increments. So it's a 10 minute game. And we are getting headed for the um, two knights attack, potentially fried liver, potentially some crazy stuff. He's offering a draw, which we are going to decline. Um, and we are going to go into my favorite crazy variation, the Ulf start um, line, which is uh, an integral part of my uh, E4, E5 beginners. Repertoire and bishop takes b5 here is not the right move and neither is bishop takes c6 So let's go back a little bit here the crazy city bishop f1 is the best move for white and the logic behind that move is is that After queen d5 white can play knight c3 and the bishop actually covers the g2 pawn And then the bishop will come back with vengeance to take the b5 pawn the immediate take creates a bit of a chaos in the position because now I have got the double attack on these two dudes and after bishop takes queen takes now I have got the two bishops nice center although it cost us a pawn um, but uh, that is no biggie at all we are happy with our initiative and now our opponent is blundering the pawn on g2 I guess I'm guessing queen f3 but then queen f3 knight f3 and bishop b7 creates a supremely filthy pin there that is going to wreak havoc so what did my opponent do wrong so far in this game was that they are playing way too fast like they know that they are playing up 1300 points um you need to respect that and when something strange like this hits you uh you need to spend time on that so now we are back to a regular position with not a lot of joy for white we have got uh, two bishops now the material is leveled and uh, king e2 is the only legal move um to stay afloat now one would be very tempted to figure out immediately how to put a lot of pressure on that knight and one move that comes to mind is the crazy g5 but the rook simply moves away from the pin and then there is not a lot to be gained somewhat um Counterintuitively, I very seriously consider here e4. In fact, this is my number one candidate move, and I really do like it. It is a move that a lot of people wouldn't consider, and instead they would play bishop d6 to defend the pawn. But once again, the principles are at play, and the principles are that if you can kick a developed knight, we should be doing it. The irony here is, is that a lot of people would refuse to play e4 because they would claim that it blocks up the bishop's diagonal. Which is all fine and well, except if I can't exploit the diagonal, which I cannot, then it's hardly an asset to have it in the first place, right? So let's do this. Kicking the knight, disallowing the easy development of the bishop. Now, of course, I reckon with knight d4, which walks into castles as a developing move, bringing my rook into the play immediately with a tempo. Or bishop c5 also hitting the knight with a tempo. Note that although I did block up the long diagonal, um, I do have e3 at my disposal whenever I see it fit. Okay, so opponent goes knight h4. I can't trap the knight because the f4, f5 square is available. Um, g2 is 2 but uh, I wouldn't go there. So castles appears to me to be most logical, bringing the rook immediately into the fray. Let's just go. It's uh, just very logical, simple chess. I expect b3. Um, yeah, okay, so we moved out of the pin. I suppose it's a logical ish move. Okay, let's go G6. The main reason why I'm playing G6 is not the fact that the pawn is hanging, just to be clear. The main reason why I played g6 was because I wanted to cut out knight f5 entirely from the equation. Now knight g2 looks a bit wonky. Because now I get to develop another piece with tempo. 
as you can see, I'm really obeying very basic chess principles. Yeah, so I'm fully developed. Uh, my rooks are connected. I'm ready to fight. His pieces are all over the shop. The rooks are not connected. The king is a little bit weird. So things are looking great. Now, naturally, I would want to play rook hg just to finish development. It may be a move that tends to tick boxes without accomplishing much, but I like the visual effect that I'm creating here a lot. Which is full development, rooks are in the fray, um, no pawn breaks available, b3 is literally only move here. And then we'll start thinking about um, how to engage. Um, yeah, after b3... Yeah, I didn't think this was good. I consider that this may be coming. Bishop c5 seems to deal with this very effectively. Bishop a6 is also a move. Um, actually, let's calculate bishop a6 just for a second because a6 loses, a4 loses to c6. So here c4 is only, which makes the d pawn backward. Then I could play bishop c5. That looks great. The immediate bishop c5 also does look great. We're a little bit spoilt for choice here. Hmm. I don't know which one to go for. Somehow I feel like... Hmm. Yeah, let's just go here and see what they do. It keeps this... In the equation, I suppose. So if they go b3, which is still the only move that I think they should be playing, then after bishop a6, c4. Okay. Okay, that, that also made sense. So now bishop a6, c4, c6. The knight can go back without hanging c4. And at this point, I thought that I would go here and here. This has been uh, on my radar for a while. The other reason why I like this maneuver, because knight h5 also prepares f5, f4, which is quite uh, handy. So for the time being, I'm not interested in cashing in on this. Maybe I should, because after c4, I have take, taken and rook d3 completely uh, clamping down on that position. Um, he's typing me some stuff about him beating Fidel Masters and stuff. So yeah, maybe bishop a6, c4, take, take, and then doing this was also quite powerful. But I'm really enjoying all the pieces on the board. And so I'm reluctant to, to give easy trades to the opponent. This is something that, not necessarily in this particular position, but in similar environment, many, many amateur lower rated players do do, in my opinion, erroneously. And that is, is that when we have a superior position, we give our opponent choices. Like... And easy moves. Sorry, no, not choices. That's what we want to do. We give our opponents easy responses. That's the one you want to avoid. So bishop a6 gives a forcing response to white because everything else loses, right? I don't want to give my opponents easy moves. And once again, it's not necessarily the best example to demonstrate it because bishop a6 may objectively be a very good move. But after knight h5, I feel like now he needs to worry about this. He needs to worry about this. He needs to worry about f5, f4. I'm not giving choices to, or I'm not giving easy moves to my opponent. I'm giving them, giving them a wide range of moves where the vast majority of those moves are actually really bad. So you want to give choice. You never want to give easy forcing moves. Now, I need to be a little bit cautious of my time. Yeah, let's just go f5. Let's just keep their clock sticking. Now we have got f4, f3. Once again, I'm adding more bite to the position. He needs to reckon with this. He needs to reckon with this. He can't move the knight because of knight f4. The tension keeps on building, building, building. I even had knight g3 check. And what happens almost always, almost always, is, is that when you keep on adding new and new threats, instead of going down in for the simplistic one movers, they almost invariably collapse and they play a blunder like this. This is just human nature. And depending on the level of pressure, and the level of momentum you build up, it happens even on very high level of chess, that people crumble under, under the pressure. It's human nature. Not only in chess, in every walks of life. 
if you keep on building up tension, 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 eventually um, they are going to make some kind of a, a mistake. King D2 is a beautiful mate here, by the way, or close to it at least. Yeah, not quite yet, but uh, rookie two check is gonna be terminal. So because of the double check, it, it's all over Red Rover. Hmm. So if I take C2, King C2, Bishop E4 check, the King can come out here and even on B3 actually. Let's just go in. This looks very healthy. I should have calculated this, but I do see that it's completely winning. And so I just um, am following my gut here rather than figuring it out until I actually get to the let's figure out the rest bit. I mean, yeah, D2 is already winning a piece, but I'm going for mate here. So how is it going to be mate? If we go check king b3. Yeah, okay, then I can start picking off lots of material. So let's go check. I'm still refusing to calculate. And this is, for that reason, it's not educational. You guys, if you had this... You should be calculating your guts out here to find out where the mate is. And frankly, the only reason why I'm not doing it is because A, I'm lazy, lazy and B, because everything wins. Um, I mean, Rook B4 wins a piece at least. Rook C1 wins a piece at least. Um, do I have a forced mate? Okay. I have an idea. So if I go down here, uh, the king can come back to a4. If I play a5, the threat is a4 mate. And if they play a4, then this becomes a mate. So I'm going to do that, but this is a little bit speculative. Um, after a3, rook b4 check, they still have king c3, so there is no mate there. So a3 is the only move that keeps them alive. And then I think what I would do is to go check king e check. And if king a5, then king b7, but luckily they walked into mate. Actually, we will be stylish. We are not going to take this. Rook c2 is a nicer mate. Yeah. So that was a, a pretty clean uh, victory. And I'm not going to um, accept the, um, the rematch here because instead what we want to do is to have a look at uh, the game review very quickly. And uh, see if we can um, summarize what went down here. I'm quite impressed. 92.2 accuracy on my end. I'm going to show you this. Um, so this is the game review. We have got 92.2, zero misses, zero blunders, zero mistakes, zero inaccuracies in fact. So I'm almost disappointed in that regard with the 92 too. Um, right, let's have a look at what uh, what happened in the game very quickly. So, and actually I'm going to shut the review down because I don't want to be bothered with these lines and all that stuff um, and I will turn the engine off to for the time being at least okay so let's see so theory 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 um, and actually I'm going to play through this no I'm not I'm going to keep, to keep it my point of view so I played d5 e d5 b5 now if you are 1100 and you don't know what to do which my opponent clearly didn't like, no idea. It's inexcusable to play this move in two seconds, especially against an international master uh, with 1,300 points rating higher than you. And I'm not saying this in a condescending slash full of myself perspective. What I'm suggesting is, is that an IM is not going to blunder a pawn like this. So you should ask yourself, what is this move doing? How I should respond? What's the idea? All that. This... Like in a 10 minute game, they should spend at least half a minute, at least, trying to figure out what's going on. Instead, they immediately play the wrong move. And after queen d5, bishop takes, pawn takes, uh, queen takes, they are already worse. Right? So, right out of the opening, we gave up the bishop pair, we lost center, our development is problematic, all principles have been broken. Now, it's not an easy line. But nonetheless, they should have been a little bit more cautious and respectful, not necessarily toward me, but that too, but towards the the concept of I am out of book. I need to adjust my thinking. I need to figure out what's going on. Um, I think that was a blunder. And now things are going really, really badly. Yeah, here it wasn't uh, awful still, but uh, yeah, let's go. There, 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 take, take, bishop b7. And um, now we are doing absolutely sensationally well. 
Um, I thought that I played this part of the game really well. Castles was good. E4 was good too. So I suppose either or. Actually, yeah, E4 is top choice. Okay, Knight H4, Castles, great. And once again, note that I'm not cashing in. I'm not running into various scenarios here. E3 certainly was a playable move. Do I need to play this? No, let's see what it accomplishes. It attacks the rook, right? If I move the rook, now the pawn is hanging. Maybe I can take on f2 and then bishop check, but somehow I feel like I'm making their life easier by cashing in too soon. Likewise, after e3, they can play f3. Again, the pawn hangs. I have to take, and all I did was that I resolved their biggest problem. And the number of people who would be jumping at the opportunity to play this is insane. Is it a bad move? No. But the reason why it's not bad is, is because my position with black is so good, it's almost impossible to play a bad move. Is it a bad move compare, compared to what types of moves I have available? Yes. Absolutely it is. It is. So I shouldn't be cashing in on it. The engine likes Hiroki 1, which is quite cunning too, creating a counter discover check opportunity. And once again, all I'm doing is develop the white pieces. White never, never, not once looked as good as white does here in the game. So E3, nay, nay, friends. We are not giving simple, easy choice, uh, easy responses. How many times can I get this wrong in this video? Um, we are not giving easy responses to our opponent. No, we complicate. We add further problems to the existing ones. Now they constantly worry about when I cash in on this, they still can't develop the bishop. The knight is weird. Problems are growing. Rook g1, g6, no worries. Knight g2 and uh, bishop d6. Once again, just simply developing, grabbing a tempo on the pawn. Easy, simple chess. h3, rook e8. Development done. Rooks connected, everybody out. We are happy. This is what good chess looks like. This is how you should never want to stand in a game of chess. No completed development, no harmony slash communication between or amongst the white pieces. The bishop is undeveloped, the rooks are disconnected. On a higher level, you would already call it a day. Knight b5, and uh, here I did miss apparently a little bit of a trickery. Bishop h2. I'm not sure if I understand this. Okay, what's the point if I go here? Bishop e5. Oh, okay, so just to inconvenience the rook and then bring the, bring the bishop back to e5 to dominate the diagonal. And if takes them back, then now e3. <whistles> what is going on here, man? This is deadly now. Wow. And if f3, then we just play knight h5, knight g3, and yeah, it's carnage. Okay, that was nice. Uh, I mean, I don't think that what I did was uh, any worse. Um, but okay, let's go. Bishop c5, knight d3, um, knight h5. Yeah, and this was the end. That was just building up pressure, pressure, pressure. If he hadn't played hit d3, I would have continued with f4 when the pending threat of f3 is uh, unbearable. So that was a great example, in my opinion, of um, how building up pressures and threats continuously rather than giving your opponent simple answers to basic questions can lead to a far easier and cleaner win than, yeah, always trying to pursue and chase those one more threats, um, which once again, I do see um, a lot of the times in lower rated chess. Also, once again, guys, any opening you play, if you are in this 11, 1200 rating bracket and you actually do play proper openings like this, it is very likely that you will get caught every now and then out of book quite early on. You must acknowledge that moment and instead of uh, dismissing it, you need to take that moment very seriously and you need to come up with an adequate answer, not only on the board, but in your mentality and your approach to it. So if B5 is where you are out, that's where you stop and you go like, what the heck? Let's have a look at what it does, try to figure out what the plan is, and then uh, adjust your answer accordingly. All right, ladies and gents, that was it uh, for the inside my head. I really should banging, should stop banging on this table. I noticed in the last video how loud it is. Apologies for that. So that was it for now. I hope you liked it. Um, I'm going to be back with the next video, but before I sign off, please don't forget to sub, to like, to super thank me if you can, and I'm going to see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.